So I'm just thankful for this opportunity. And yeah, you know, it's sometimes you serve the Lord for 30 something years and you plow, you plow, you plow, you contend, contend, contend. You know, you, you walk into doors, God opens, and after that you say, now what? You know, I've been planted, I've been, plant, I've been planting, sowing, part of movements. Uh, and uh, also, you know, because you simply want to steward what God wants to do in times, knowing times and seasons, you know. Just like somebody said, the spirit of God is something that is to be, can be caught, not taught. There's some things you don't understand by learning through, you know, just simply studying books or going to university. You know, last, <clears throat> during pandemic past, or before that, I don't know what happened. When we sold our building, God told us to sell our building. We have a 20,000 square foot building. And we sold it, or 15,000 square foot. We sold it before COVID. And I said, why, Lord? I, I mean, and there were some, you know, I said, because there were, there were debates, you continue this, you know. Then we have some people leaving the church, and I said, okay, you know, there's something to this. We're doing everything right. You know, have you done, have you done, you're doing everything right, but it seems like, okay, what else does there need, what is there, there we still need to do, I need to do that, that I haven't done yet? What is it that I still need to do that I haven't done yet? But you cannot, like, you know, yeah, look at the, what you have come, done, and, and you have seen a little fruit of it. But I think it's not because God doesn't love you. It's just because God called you to be a pioneer, right? To plow the ground for the next generation, for the next season. And so, you know, it's, and it is, so we, I believe we're in that moment. I, I feel like I was just asking the Lord, what is it that he wanted me to share with you tonight, this, uh, this afternoon? And I, I, and I think I have a little, I, I mean, I have a glimpse of it. And I don't have, I think, uh, may, I truly believe there's some things that God wants to reveal and come things that God wants to hide, right? The prophetic movement, the church of Jesus Christ is so guilty that God shows us, you know, strategies and we too quick to reveal it and the enemy comes to usurp it and steals it away or delays it. He can stop it. He delays it, usurps it or try to... Force you to, to, to go around the, or travel the wilderness for 40 years. And there's something God says, you know, it is something I revealed to do, be, be done in secret. Don't show the devil the strategy. You know, and I, you know, this seven mountain strategy, I think, you know, started in California or through, you know, the seven mountains thing. You know what you're talking about, you know, but it's not something new. But people talked about it and I think for... Uh, uh, <laughs> To, to, to influence society. And I think the strategy was revealed too soon. Just like Joseph revealed his calling and this strategy of God too soon. You know, and there's something that God hides. You know, he's a God that hides. And, in, and he believes in times and seasons. You, you know what I'm talking about? What is a season? It is, it is learning, knowing with in a long perspective, the plan of God. A long under perspective and understanding of the plans of God and learning how to decipher it. That God is a God of times and seasons, a God of times and seasons, the Kronos and the Kairos, the now time and the time, opportunity time, and the time that is coming, the season that's coming. Anybody getting this? Yeah. Amen. Okay. So, and I, I find myself in, in, in times and season where I say, why, why me, why, what's my purpose here, you know, and, and it's complicated, things are complicated, the, not the way you and I sees it, and the church, I think, has to know that, that we need to learn how to become doorkeepers, you know, and, and steward, and I was just sharing with, uh, you know, my, my wife and, and uh, Charity. said so the church of God has understood one part of the kingdom, which is spiritual awakening. You know, spiritual awakening. You know, the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Righteousness and justice. Righteousness, spiritual aspect of the kingdom. 
and, and then Matthew 16 and Math, uh, Mark 16 and Matthew 28. Those dual, dual mission, mandate of the kingdom. That is to preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, build church. That's the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Understand revival, outpouring all the spirit, manifestations, gold, silver, whatever. You know, those are good stuff, you know. We enjoy that. We, I was part of it, early charismatic movement. I was just talking to a friend pastor during the charismatic movement. I spoke at the Women's Glow in Chicago, and we were just talking about how the early Catholic church experienced a real move of God called the charismatic movement. We talk about Father Bertolucci and John Michael Talbot and I was birthed out of that, you know. And we would sing simple songs like, Hallelujah, right? And we would sing songs like, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longed after thee. You alone on my heart desire and I long to worship thee. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He is so good to me, I love Him so, I love Him so, I love Him so, He is so good to me. My man, very simple, uncomplicated song. But when you start singing it, boom, the Spirit of God hits you in waves, right? Like waves, suddenly the atmosphere is filled with electricity and everyone in the place in unison sings in the Spirit. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And then the rhythm, the rhythmic, the chorus, the angel sings with you, boom, holy pandemonium breaks out. You know, I'm like, that's ah! Where is that? What happened to that? You know? Now in the days we had to sing like for hours and hours and then, you know, suddenly... After an hour of worship, one hand raised up. <laughs> Two hours of worship, second hand. Then, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean? 45-inch TV. <laughs> and, they, and then suddenly, oh, they got lost in a little bit in the presses. 65-inch. <laughs> then suddenly, they get touched by the power of God. Oh, 100-inch. Like this. That's like, it's like, you know, it's like measuring how big it is. You know, I've seen that from this. <laughs> hey, right. But then again, when is that vertical lift off? When you don't need, you know what? I tell the same thing. I was asking, this guy used to, you know, was part of revival in Brownsville, you know? Uh, Lindo Cooley. So, Lindo, what do you have to say? For three hours. People are asking. He doesn't, and somebody said, well, I know somebody asked that me one time. He said, uh, does it take for God to move? Three hours for God to move? <laughs> no, he said, it takes three hours for us to get on the groove. Right? right? Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm not talking why I'm talking about this kind of stuff. But... But I truly believe that it's things that God is teaching us, the simplicity of things. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And we kind of complicate it. Hallelujah. So I've been part of revival. I've been part of revival. Toronto revival, charismatic revival. But I'm saying that because I, the charismatic movement, and I've just met another guy who started the church with Tom Hines. Christian Life Cathedral. Have you heard? Sister Rose, you know what? They're pioneering worship and all that stuff. And, of course, later on, you went a little bit, you know. <laughs> but then again, but these are things that need to be visited. Things God, when God 
visits. That's why when we go to Israel, the significant places where you experience God. Sea of Galilee, Mount Beatitudes, and all these places where you see the residue of the presence of God, right? Amen. The portals, I would talk about portals where God has pretty much visited man, and we dig the place and we say, God, we want that visitation. We want the same visitation that that man experienced, that Jacob experienced. Isaiah experienced, the Ezekiel experienced, the Elijah experienced. We want that. You know, and I truly believe this whole thing about pandemic is just simply God revealing the heart of the church more than anything else. You know, everywhere I go, it's, oh, oh, we lost this guy. We lost that guy. We lost that guy. They'd be, it's time to get back to worship. Amen. People. Vacation time is over. <laughs> Amen. But I'm just thankful because, you know, and uh, all righty. Let's go back to. All righty. So, you know, this whole dynamic of serving the Lord is, is a journey. It's, 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 it's uh, if, if you'd learn to move with God, it's not complicated. It takes work. It takes plowing. Sacrifices. Uh, it's not easy. Not easy. But it's rewarding. You know, because you see, and sometimes it's also not just rewarding, but sometimes it's discouraging. Very discouraging. And I, I don't have to reveal everything to you, you know, so uh, I don't want to get a letter from anybody. Anybody? <laughs> Amen. But you know, I want to read something. You know, I want to thank you. Hey, guys, thank you so much for, for joining. I hear things that God says in this season. You know, I've been doing, you know, uh, well, as like John, Dawn has said, I'm right now the national uh, outreach, the, the outreach director, uh, a coordinator for Christian Nights for Israel. We have 11.5 million members. We want to teach and disciple the church how to stand with Israel and the Jewish people and the blessing that comes with the covenant of God. And uh, we take pastors to Israel and we sponsor every pastor. You know, we pay for them to go. Every year we have taken thousands of pastors to Israel uh, and uh, to visit the place, the land of the Bible, and to really understand the times and seasons we're living in and where Israel uh, plays in, in this whole Agenda of God for nations, you know, and, uh, you know, her heaven and earth passes away, Israel stays there, it remains. Nations can come and go, Israel remains, amen. It is the covenant of God, not so much about reading the, per, the how good the people are. People say, well, why is it that the Jews are this and that? And it's not about the people, it's not really about the character, or how perfect, how good they are. No, it's about really... The coming of God for the land and the people that He has chosen, that He would want to, re that He wants to redeem and accomplish and finish what He started, and He will accomplish His covenant with them to show the whole world that He alone is God, that He alone is a faithful God. But He finishes what He started. Amen. He is a faithful God. This, the story of His faithfulness and His eternal pursuit for His people, regardless of who they are, how they are. You know, the command of God that when they fall, God forgive them, restore them. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that that God has not rejected the people whom he has chosen to be, to carry his inheritance to the nations because they messed up. Come on. We, I am a story of messed up. I mean, and God makes all things beautiful. Out of misery, out of miry clay, out of imperfection, God makes some a tapestry, a mosaic, amen, a museum piece that after God is finished with you, people will say, wow. You know what I'm talking about? How can it be? How can God make something out of nothing? Out of something that is ugly, something beautiful. A masterpiece. 
Amen. And now many of you know that you guys are the masterpieces of God. Whoa. Somebody said, who, me? Yes, you. If you look at things through God's lenses and God's perspective. And you know what? The Lord rebuked me the other day. He said, Herman, did you know it's not about you? It's about me. Sometimes your trouble, your agony, your frustration, your depression, we think, oh, God, oh. God says, hey, it's not about you. It's not about, it's what I'm going to do. So just trust me in this process. Just trust me in this process. Amen. It's time to let go and surrender. Amen. I don't know what I'm saying. This is not really part of my note. Amen. But the words I'm speaking forth, this is the word the Lord showed me. Redemption. Some of you have been redeemed by the Lord. You know, you've met somebody and you talked to somebody and you found out they're a Christian and say, oh, where do you go to church? What do you do? And then, you know, you've been walking in the wrong direction, the wrong company, and you met somebody, points you in the right direction, Tell points you to the Lord and say, oh, wow, where do you go to church? Amen. <laughs> right? Like divine moment that God is arranging for you to meet people. Right. Some of you, in this, in the pro you're in this process of redemption. Amen. The problem we have in America today is that we have lost the sense of understanding of our purpose. Of America's lost its purpose. We have a lost sense of destiny for our nation. Are you listening here? I know you are. Because God has put you in this country for a purpose. Not just to make money. This month is Asian American Heritage Month. Right? And of course, you know, the White House is doing a big thing about it. And I said, well, no, I'm going to preach somewhere, so I can't go. Yeah, they have a big celebration in D.C., celebrating Asian American. But if you look at Asian American heritage, man, highest income, highest paid, highest educated people group in the world. If you're Filipino, you should be proud of it. Filipinos, you look at it. Sometimes it's the Filipinos or the Indians, highest income, highest paid. Look at this. Highest, look, at, look at Google. Google it. Peer research. The Filipinos... 4.3 million, and the biggest, 4.3, you know, Chinese people, they make a lot of babies. I'm telling you, they're number one now. They got more people in among Asian Americans. But let me tell you, my friends, my friends, my family, you're in the kingdom for such a time as this. No wonder, you, well, you should be dead because of COVID, right? But God didn't allow that to happen because he has a purpose and there's a plan for you. Yes. I tell people it doesn't matter if, you know, the story of the disciples, Pastor Jesus was in the boat, and they're all screaming as, like little kids, Oh, we're going to perish! We're going to perish! We're going to perish! We're going to die! You know? And then Jesus, they look at Jesus. Jesus was snoring in the back of the boat. Like, you know, Jesus just had having siesta, right? And then the disciples said, oh, hey, we're dying here. Hey, anybody there? We're sinking. And Jesus like, <laughs> right? Yeah. How do you know that it doesn't matter, COVID, what God is not shaken by? Amen. It doesn't alter his plan concerning you. It doesn't change this man concerning you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, that's, <laughs> it doesn't, and then of course, finally, you know, Jesus got tired of their screaming and complaining. And Jesus said, okay, he woke up and he said, uh, stop, peace be still. Right? And then the Bible says everything stopped. When Air, rain, stop. And Jesus said, where is your faith? Right? And I believe we're in that season 
You know the word amen comes from the root word emuna. Means so be it. Amen. It is a result of faithfulness, a result of God's faithfulness. Amen. That he will accomplish it for you. It's about who's, how faithful he is. He will do it for you because he's faithful. The word emuna means so be it, may it be. Amen. Amen. So it's not really, it's not dependent on you, on your ability, on your, you know, on your power and your goodness for him to fulfill his plan. It is because of his faithfulness. He said, I will do it not because of you. Sorry, it's not about you. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> Isn't that refreshing and liberating? Yes. That you will walk in authority and blessing not because of you. Right. Jesus said, you didn't choose, choose me, I chose you. Yes. Hallelujah. So he said, okay, so be it. I will accomplish it because of my faithfulness. It is done. It is finished. You know, of course, you know, the faith journey is civil, difficult, because we have our own timetable. Amen. That's why I believe, I'm just going to shuffle my sermon here. Because I believe we're in the season of Esther moment. The times and season. We need to understand the times and the seasons we live in, and we need to know what we ought to do. Amen. Hallelujah. What time is it? <laughs> the Kronos. You know, we're so, we are so occupied with the Kronos that we fail to see the season, the Kairos. Amen. We're so busy looking at the Kronos. What time is it? Oh, oh, I can do this. I can do that. I can do this. This, do that, that. Need this, this. Booty, 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 that. Do. I said, no, I want you to understand perspective. Amen. You, we planned this, 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 this long. God plans this long. Amen. Our perspective is, is about this. We see it. This way. God says, that way. Amen? Left and right, front and back. But we look at things on the Kronos time. I hope this makes sense. I hope this is making sense. And sometimes you want to understand this by looking at this. Again, I'm, sometimes we want to figure things out that what did the Lord say eyes has not seen mind what the Lord has amen eternity and we want to see it through the lens of Kronos and predict everything by what we see in front of us right God says, no, I'm the beginning and the end. I declare the beginning and the end. From the end. Amen. Alpha and Omega. So we're in a season. I'm, by the way, I'm preaching already. I haven't quoted a verse yet, but I'm preaching already. You as individuals, we need to know times and seasons and learn to decipher the moment we live in so that you can walk in, with authority and effectivity and wisdom and prosperity. <sighs> I was in, I was just having a retreat with some of the leaders in San Antonio. The other, my wife and I were invited with one of the, one of our friends of God is blessed so much, you know. Woman of God. Her name is Melissa. I'm not going to tell you. But she started her business 15 years ago with $300. Nobody believed her. They saw things this way. Right? With this chronos. Now, it's all. Oh, who you think you are? You don't have the ability. You're a single mom. You know? You failed the marriage, you failed. Not even his family believed her. But she came to me and said, Oh, I get pastor, I got this vision. And her family laughed at her. 
And finally, you know, the brother said, well, you know, if you could get one client, maybe I'll entertain. And she got one client with $300. But she said, Pastor, what do you think? I just she said, believe it's God. God gave that vision to you. It's going to change you. It's going to change other people. It can change the world and help others. She didn't, she didn't, people didn't believe her. But she saw God's plan and purpose, times and seasons. Amen. Sometimes God gives you a vision of what he wants you to do. He doesn't reveal to you how to get there. Amen. He just gives you a, you know, a little increment of it. Increment. Just follow, just follow the, the footprint. Just follow the footprint. Just listen to the wind. Amen. Just follow the smell. Oh. Oh. You know, I can, if I, I can, when I go out there, if I smell, I, if I smell Korean barbecue, my nose can follow it wherever it is. Can, you know what I'm talking about? The pastor, right? You know what I mean? You, you, so, times, you need to times. So, in, make the long story short, 15 years of journey, I, you know, spoken to encourage her, build her up. And she sold last, two years ago, a year ago, her business from 300 to $700 million. Wow. That's not bad for 15 years. Of, that's not really bad at all, you know. I mean, and she said, Pastor, oh, I don't need to reveal to you. Said, How much debt do you have? I said, well, honey, let's go five houses. <laughs> let's go buy this and buy this and buy this. So I didn't do that. I said, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'll pay it off. Whatever you did, I'll pay it off. I said, are you serious? And I said, yeah, I am serious. The reason I'm saying that, because there are not a whole lot of people. People talk. You know, Hollywood, I, I, you know, I don't know. When the star in Hollywood says, I, Mr. So-and-so donated $5,000. And like the whole Hollywood says, wow, they're so generous. <laughs> right? They say, oh, oh, I don't know, I'm not going to say, oh, Mr. Depp gave this, or Mr. You know, Mr. and Mrs. This, he gives that, you know? And we adore them. But let me tell you, I believe God's going to raise up sons and daughters of God in those times and seasons where God's going to entrust you the ability to acquire great wealth so that you can fulfill God's mission. Ah. Pastor, I don't believe in buildings anymore. I'm so sorry. And church buildings. I don't believe in church buildings anymore. I believe in acquiring properties. Amen. You know. I don't believe in just build something so that you can just have a church Sunday morning. I believe God is showing things, giving us property, and increasing our wealth, and increasing our knowledge of, for economic development, for kingdom building. Amen. Can, in connection to God's kingdom plan for nations. Amen. So I was in this place, you know, and when I was there, the greatest minds of financial people Investors, you know, capital, capital, uh, venture capitalists, people, you know, somebody came to me and said, hey, you know, I have $28 billion. I, I need to know where to invest it. And I said, here's my card. I didn't say that. But he's looking for businesses where he can invest. He said, seems like, you know, maybe the Asian community can avail of it. You're business people, right? Maybe you can, maybe I can lend them, you know. $28 billion, right? I mean, if it's not that, you know, look at, look, I'm just going to, I'm going to challenge you. Look at this guy, Elon Musk. Maybe you don't like Elon Musk, but this is like he's the Einstein of our generation. He's a disruptor. I might not agree with everything he's doing, but he's a disruptor. He shakes things up. He makes things different. Come on. Before Astronauts traveling to stars were just simply for the elite. Now, it's easy. Shoot you up in the sky. In one day, you become an astronaut. You, you know what I'm saying? You know I'm talking about? There are things that God is doing things far different than the way we do things now. And a lot quicker and a lot faster. You know why? 
God has a timetable. It's accelerating time. He does not have any more time to waste. Not because he doesn't have all time, but he has an agenda for the nations. Amen. Right? And sometimes people God say, well, if God wants me to have it, he'll bring it to me. It doesn't work that way, Pastor, right? It doesn't work that way. Everything God reveals to you is free, but you have to go, man, you got to fight giants. Amen. You have to create opportunity. You have to plow the ground. And this is a season, I believe God's doing things. The word that the Lord told me is really, for some of you, is redemption. God's going to redeem what you've lost. But Acts chapter 3, 18 to 21 it says, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets saying that this Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that sins may be wiped out and times of refreshment comes from the Lord. Let me interrupt first. The Lord just reminded me. As I said before, people, ministries have perspective of the spiritual things of God. But there are two aspects of the kingdom. One is spiritual one is governmental. I'm going to say it again. One is spiritual. Is one is governmental. It's not politics. It's governmental. What does it mean governmental? It's order. It's authority. It's structure. Kingdom is a structure. Kingdom of God is not just like, you know, a... It's not, uh, it's not a what you call it. It's not a... Uh, uh, what's the big concert that flopped? Uh, stock, Woodstock. You know, they just knock out and just everybody just, you know, just free willing. Just do whatever they want to do. It has a structure. The kingdom of God operates in a structure. The kingdom of God operates in a system. So the kingdom of God, both spiritual and governmental. What happens when the church and the ministry focuses so much on the spiritual things, building the church, building the ministry, all the spiritual aspects of the kingdom, and they reach the ceiling, and they hit the ceiling? They're all successful. They're all a big church. And now they say, now what? Now what? Now that I have so much, and I've seen it. Have you seen uh, You have seen it. You've seen it on news. You have it on TV. Right? A ministry reaches the pinnacle and have so much members, so many you know, he's seen on TV, and the pastor gets involved with stupid things. Why? Because he cannot connect the spiritual with the governmental aspect of the kingdom. The moment they achieve the spiritual aspect, they stop. They say, ah, I have arrived. I hope this makes sense. Amen. God is saying, no, I'm not just interested in revival I'm not just interested of an awakening. I'm not just, I'm just interested of cleaning you up, making you restore you, empower you. I'm calling you to disciple nations, to transform society. That the kingdom of this world shall become the kingdom of this Christ. Amen. That you will manifest the kingdom, the order of the kingdom on earth. So that earth becomes a habitation where God's glory manifests. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heaven, you know, that, you know what the assignment of the church is? The assignment of the church is to make sure that we demonstrate the kingdom. Amen. That the earth that he has created would reflect the kingdom. Of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And beyond. And more. Amen. And the people, they just like to flop and flip. And that's all. They end up there. But God says, after the flopping, the flipping, the rolling, and all that, what's next? And that's, I believe, we need to understand. You're in the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther thought, well, my goal is to be married to the king. One night with the king changes everything, all preparing yourself, beautifying yourself, right? And one day, of course, she got married to the king. And she relaxed and said, ah, this is life. 
Oh, living la vida loca. <laughs> right? She thought, hey, I'm a tree, I'm a ha, ha, ha. Esther said that. Right? And then one day he got a, she got a visit from an uncle named Mordecai. <laughs> it's Esther, daughter, I know you're sitting pretty. I know you're looking good. I know you're walking with your gown, all dressed in white, with all the apparels and the gold and the glitter and all that. You know, if you got time, let's talk. <laughs> Amen. And one day they met and said, Esther, we have a problem. <laughs> you know, and remember your people, the Jews? This guy who works for the king gave order that all the Jews would be murdered and killed because they did not refuse to this guy named Haman. Right? He's egotistic assistant to the president. <laughs> they, and then they didn't want to bow to him. Right? And he deceived the king. And the king gave an edict because he deceived the king. He told the king that this group of people rebelling against you, O king. So declare an edict to kill, destroy the Jews. And Esther said, what? So what? I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm nothing to do with me. I'm living a good life. And you know what Haman said, Esther, if you don't do what God called you to do, you will die. I will die. Your relatives will die. All your people will die muerte. Amen. Amen. And you know what Esther said? What if I die? He said, Mordecai said, Esther, I let me remind you, daughter. That's not God's original, ultimate intention for you to live good. <laughs> Amen. To achieve a good life, a picket fence, house, car, and the ultimate goal not to drive a brand new Tesla. <laughs> That's not my <laughs> Oh, if I wish, if I were a rich man, I will buy a Tesla. <laughs> That's not my goal that you live somewhere in the foothills of somewhere. Oh, come on, you know, huh? you're in California. I'm talking about here, right? Oh, I wish you could live up there in Santa Monica on top of the hill. That's not, Esther, that's not my ultimate plan for you. He said, you are in the kingdom for such a time as this, understand times and seasons. I tell people, you know why some people get sick and then they don't die and then some tragedy happens? God is just, just trying to say, hey, don't forget, not about you. I still have a plan for you. Amen. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. You just have to follow. Amen. And then, you know, Esther said, well, if I die, I die. You know what? The story ends, right? God used her to save her people. That's destiny. Amen. Times and season, the chronos, the, the moment and the seasons. The moment is the now, the opportune time. Chronos is, you know, the hour. Kairos is like, you know, opportune time is an open door for you, right? Opportunity. Seasons is talking about, okay, the plan of God from now till there. How do you decipher that? Right? And we need to understand the structure of the kingdom that gets you from point A to B. Does it make sense, Pastor? Does it make sense? The reformation of... Oh... Amen. You know, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to. But when they talk about prison reform, okay, prison reform. Everybody heard about prison reform in the First Step Act where that whole bill was signed but passed by Congress 
where it gives people that got out of jail because a lot of 70% of people in jail are African Americans, right? Remember that? The bill that was passed by Trump and signed by the Congress. Not passed by Trump. It was passed. People thought it was passed by Trump, but it wasn't really passed by Trump. It was people that I know who put that bill and presented it to Congress and said, you got to do something about it. Everybody else, you know, we got more people incarcerated and they, the recidivism, meaning after they leave the jail, it takes about less than a year, they go back to jail. Sometimes two years, and after they go back to jail, there's no purpose of them integrating the society and rehab and trying to teach them how to live a different life, a productive life. And you know, if you know that there's an increase of incarceration among Asian Americans by 200%. The Asian American here? That's reform. So I was there in the middle in the White House talking to black leaders, Hispanic leaders, and myself, the only Asian guy. So I was invited by another friend. And I said, Well, what about Asian representation in America? You know, we just build 14,000, just build a transcontinental railroad. We help you build the transcontinental railroad. You know what it is. That's how you transport goods from one end of the country to, another, to, to the other states. That's, we, we still use the same railroad, right? Filipinos build fisheries, build pretty much uh, help build a lot of the mines, build cotton fields, farms. Filipinos did a lot of that. You don't see that in history books. So I said, but there's an incarceration attack against Asian Americans all over the place. <sighs> I have a different take on that. I have a different take on that. Let me tell you, you know, why Asian Americans are being attacked. It didn't start with George Floyd. I'm going to tell you, it didn't start with George Floyd. Talk to me about later. Let me tell you about that. But you know, when there's polarity, oh, ideals collide, collide. It creates some tension and frustration. Different philosophy, different ideas, different way of life, different methodologies and practices. And one ends it this way, the other one ends that way. And then culture collapses because there's confrontation of different ideas and ways things, the way things are done. So I sat there in the White House and I said to the people there, I said, no, we need to pass this. Because a lot of people in prison get out of prison, they're going back to prison and you're just simply repeating the cycle, right? So we get to pass that thing. I never got a pat on back from anybody. But somebody in Hollywood took credit for it. <laughs> you know who? You know, somebody took credit for it. Very high profile. You know? Has reality TV. They have reality. <laughs> you know, until now. But she took credit for it. They had nothing to do with it. But let me tell you, my friends, God can reveal things to you. And, uh, amen. God is interested of Transforming culture, and that just has having good church. I hope it makes sense. We need to think, decipher how God's strategy revealed to us, and how can we apply ourselves into it so that we can see communities, cities, schools transform, reform that would reflect God's kingdom on earth. Amen. You know, one of the greatest offerings of worship to the Lord is that when what we do on earth reflects heaven. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Right. When you see change, when you see real change, and then there's, there's the sense of adoration. Wow, how can it be? Amen. And all people could say, it's God. Had nothing to do with us. Nothing to do about our ability, though he uses it. Amen. Okay. 
Acts 3.19. Repent then the, and turn to God so the sins may be wiped out. Uh, that times of refreshing. Thank you, honey. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord, from the presence of the Lord, that he may send the Messiah whom he has appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive it until now, until the time comes from God to restore all things. Amen. To restore all things, to restore everything as he has promised long ago through his holy prophets. His holy prophets. I believe God is in the restoration business. Word renew, I believe this is it. You're going to see God power to restore things in your life in this season. There's an anointing for restoration that's going to be released in a greater measure, far beyond our ability to do things, even doing things in the right way, things that God can, only God can do. What is restoration? The word restoration means to renew. Say renew. renew. Restore. Refresh, rejuvenate, renew. Amen. That is, the, that is the human definition of it. But let me read to you. The way God, re- do the, the word restoration is to receive back more than has been lost to the point where the final state is greater than the original condition. I'm going to read it again. What is God's plan? How is he going to redo it in your life? He receives, you receive back more than has been lost. How many of you lost stuff? Lost income, lost money, lost resources, opportunities. And the word restoration is to receive back more than has lost to the point where the final state is greater than the original condition. Amen. Amen. Not just bring you back to the original. God says, that and better. Amen. Hallelujah. The main point is that someone is something is improved beyond measure. God restores. He restores and he always restores it in abundance. Amen. And abundance above and beyond all you could ask or imagine. Huh. How many of you are here? If God gives you the resources now, you know exactly what to do with it. Raise your hand. That, that explains it. <laughs> Amen. Because if God gives you $100 million right now and you really don't know where to use it, you're receiving it. <laughs> Amen. You know why? Because the moment you get the check of 100 million, you're going to buy a house in Hawaii and retire until Jesus comes. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> this is, this is, see, we better, God, He gives you with a purpose, He blesses with your purpose. We need to start seeing things. Oh, God, I'm asking this because I, no, I have to do this. Amen. Joel chapter 2, verse 25 to 26. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, and the hopper and destroyer and the cutter. My great army which I sent among you. Of course, you have to see the context of it. The children of Israel were in disobedience. Therefore, God disciplined them. But God died definitely in the ultimate scheme of things. God restored them more than beyond what they ever had. You shall eat and and plenty and be satisfied. The praise of the name of the Lord your God who is dead wonderfully with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame. Amen. Jeremiah 30, verse 17 For I will restore health to you, and your wounds I will heal, declares the Lord, because they gave and because they have called you an outcast, it's Zion for whom now no one cares. Uh, Psalm 51, 12. I'm just going to read some verses here. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold upon me a willing spirit. So you see the story of God restoring the fortunes of Job that he lost. Remember God restoring the fortunes of Job? He restored it. The story of God's restoration. And he is in that business of restoration. 
The Bible says times of refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. That he will restore all things. And he will restore all things. See, what is, the, what is Elijah's mission? What is the, the, the spirit of Elijah's mission? To turn the hearts of the father to the children. But then, the Bible says, God will send the prophet Elijah to restore all things. Amen? I believe it's a baptism. It's a fresh baptism upon the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. To understand times and seasons. Moments of visitation that God is going to do in the earth. And you and I can partner in the work of the kingdom. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm just going to cut. Uh, God is restoring kingdom strategies. What does it mean? Economic development. Like the sons of Esau I've talked to you about. Walking in revelation and knowledge and understanding of the times and season. About his plan, his agenda, and his hour. God is calling us in our, to, to use our uniqueness, our mind, our ideas, our calling, our ability to strategically and to strategize and think broadly, globally. Things about kingdom, about the work of the kingdom. There's a sense of creativity that's being poured out. Some people, you know, the Lord told me, Herman, a lot of people lost their mind, their mental health. They can no longer process things in, in a way I want them to process it. They have lost the sense of even just the basic judgment between right and wrong. To process things in the more practical level. And the more walking in wisdom, people seems like lost the sense of knowing things and knowing things rightly. Right? It's like... For some reason, people just, the enemy has confused them. And they're spinning in circles. And they, you know what happens? We end up attacking one another because we're confused. My people perish for lack of knowledge. My friends, I want to break the spirit of confusion of your mind. May God create, give you the creativity of mind. To understand God's plan and idea and purpose for you. Amen. I just want to pray that over you right now. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear. I'm going to say it again. God has not given you the spirit of fear. I rebuke fear in your life. Fear of loss. Fear of losing income. Fear of not known. Fear of so many things in, in the area of business and family. Fear, fear, fear. I break the spirit of fear off of you right now in Jesus' name. Over America. Amen. You know, you know I've been visited by, I've mean, been visited by the spirit of fear. It is so paralyzing. You could move. When people fears, they lose the sense of focus. You're paralyzed, right? Oh, COVID, for example. When, the, you know, when COVID touches your body, you lose a sense of just making the right decision. You're paralyzed with fear. You, you couldn't breathe anymore. You can't speak anymore. It's like you lose the sense of who you are. The church, God's people, lost the sense of who they are, their calling, their destiny, their purpose. We have become like living zombies, the walking dead. Amen. And I'm telling you right now prophetically, I speak life over you. I speak life over you. I speak Zoe life. I have come that you might have life, not fear. I've come that you might have life. And those who are watching have come that you might have life. That fear needs to be broken in that cocoon. You're living in that cocoon of fear. And God says, if you simply step out, you will see greater things. You will see greater things. Opportunities. Expansion. Multiplication. Blessing. Amen. Step out of your fear, out of your cocoon. Amen. You know, my wife... You know, my friend, I told you, what changed her book was a children's book about the caterpillar. 
right? How the caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. The caterpillar, like worms, they have to climb up the tree, right? And this caterpillar says, oh, you can't reach the, reach the tree. It's hard to reach the tree. Some quit. Right? You can't reach the top of the tree. Some quit. Others persevered and crawled all the way to the top, right? And then to the place where they're supposed to be, and they start hanging there. They know this is where God wants me to be. And the process, oh, begins. Um, the metamorphosis begins because in, they're in the right place at the right time, at the right season, because they're no longer walking in fear when the people around them discourages them. No, you can't reach up there. It's so, you know, they don't, the worm doesn't automatically transform into a butterfly. You didn't know that? It takes survival. It takes some time of inching your way all the way where God wants you to be. And then you become a cocoon. And then out of the cocoon comes out a beautiful multicolored butterfly. Amen. And I just want to break the spirit of fear over you. The Bible says, not fear. I have come that you might have life. Say life. life. I speak life to you. Something, maybe something that's been dead or breathing or in a respirator in your life. Maybe your spiritual life. Maybe whatever it is. Maybe you're just simply breathing, moving, but you're actually dead. You're just existing. You're just going through the motion of things. And God says, I'm going to inject fresh life inside of you and energize you. I'm going to pour fresh matcha inside of you. <laughs> when, I'm just saying matcha because whenever I need to get energy, I get matcha and then I get energized. But better than matcha, better than green tea. <laughs> Amen. He's going to infuse his life inside of you and he'll quicken your mortal body. I believe God's pouring out that same Anointing in your life for creativity in this hour, in this season where you're living right now. A fresh injection, infusion of eternity, of kingdom, of something that is heaven, birthed from above. Amen. Hallelujah. And after this, I want to pray. Yeah. And the thing also is that God restoring the vision. America's lost its vision. We were created for a purpose. This mission was birthed for a purpose. Amen. But we are missing our purpose. The purpose that why God created us. Every nation has a purpose. Every mission has a, nation has a destiny. You can't compare the Philippines. People say, well, the Philippines is this, America is this, China is this. No, every nation has a destiny God gave them. We can't compare it. We cannot say, we want the nation to be like America. Or we want the nation to be like South Korea. We want, you know, let me tell you, Pastor, when South Korea, when Paul Young Cho visited the Philippines, Manila, in the 1960s, he went out to Manila and he said, my dream that one day... South Korea will become like Manila. Think about that. Think where Manila is now, the Philippines, compared to South Korea. You know what I'm talking about? My friends, we're in this season where I believe God's going to bring restore all things, your lost dreams, your lost visions in your life. And the same thing with America as a nation. God has restored its original purpose. You came to this nation, you are black and white. All precious in his sight. Because he wants you to fulfill, help fulfill his plan and his destiny for this great nation. There's a better way. It's not the Washington D.C. way. It's not the Congress way. It's not the House of Representatives way. It's the kingdom way. And I believe God is raising up on women that will restore America to its purpose and its vision. To be a shining light, a beacon, a city set on a hill that cannot be removed. 
Ah. And I tell people, hey, I tell my white friends and my black friends, look who's talking. A guy from the Philippines calling you, calling America to its destiny. Amen. Because I believe in fulfilling the plan of God for nations. Psalm chapter 2. My son, you are my son. Today you, I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give to you the nations for your inheritance, oh my son. You will receive the inheritance from nations. And those nations will fulfill its destiny to reflect my kingdom on earth. That's the purpose of the nations. And you and I should first that's the ability, that's how much trust God has for us. Really? Really? That's the question that the devil kind of confused the devil. God created man, the devil said, that you made them to partner with you. Them instead of me. That's what they're jealous, the devil is so jealous of man. Because God created man and even man said, I will share my glory with this, this, this man, men and women. And they will carry my glory and reflect my glory, my kingdom on the earth. They devil said, nah. They're worthless. Remember, you know what he said? Remember Job. <laughs> I mean, they can, my friends, God has more faith in you to, that you can partner with him. And transforming nations and bring forth revival. Really? Why would God share his dream with you? Because he trusts you, you can, he can, your partner with him to do and accomplish it. Oh, how beautiful is that? Amen. Not because of us. But because of him. Uh, I want you to stand on your feet. Oh, I'm saying this not to cast more burdens on you. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. There's a creativity anointing that's being released upon you to do things in a different way that the gift and the callings of God in you will come alive. Some things that you haven't tapped into yet. Something you haven't discovered yet. Amen. Something that's hidden inside of you has been suppressed by the enemy because of fear. Somebody said, what's the richest place on earth? What is the richest, the wealthiest real estate on earth? Where? The cemetery. Because that's where dreams, dreams, big dreams, inventions, ideas died with those people. Was never, it came to, never came to fruition. And I'm telling you, my friends, God is releasing and restoring all things, releasing creativity, releasing anointing for breakthrough, releasing anointing to know times and seasons, releasing to know God's wisdom and knowledge, releasing upon you that you will know where you are in this hour of the church and how you would partner with him from this place of the nations. <sighs> oh, thank you, Lord. How many of you here, God has given you an, uh, this desire to create wealth? Come on, raise your hand. How many of you don't want money? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> How many of you, God is burning in your spirit? It's like you don't understand it, but it's connecting you, key people. It's like strategic people. How many of you have experienced that? Or people that have influence, you know? And suddenly, op God opening doors. It's not about for you to, it's not because so that God gives you the bragging right. Oh, I met this guy. I met this guy. You know, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be honest with you. At the White House, when Trump was there, that group of, <laughs> I'm going to be honest, that group of preachers that would show up and they just simply want the photo up. And they just don't do anything. They just go up and say, hey, look at me. And I said, so sorry for you. <laughs> Amen. I tell them, doesn't matter who's in power. When God placed in that place where you can touch people, he didn't just, 
What you do? They said, you get a picture from Obama. I was with Obama. I, I helped me there at Obama White House, helping them and all. Not God, because God wants you to have a seat, a time of photo up so they can show it. You have a bragging right, you met so-and-so. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. God give you this connection, put you in the place of influence, or touch somebody that has influence, because God wants you to know, hey, I have a plan for you, and I want you to partner with me in touching lives and transforming community, changing school, changing society, and bring forth the glory of God, manifest the glory of God in the earth. So that you, this earth can, this earth can be a praise for God. You know what God said? Give me no rest until I make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Give near me no rest until I make your schools, your community, your church a place of habitation that would reflect the kingdom of God in the earth. Oh, Don, I know you carry it. Priscilla, I know you carry it. Because Pastor Jerry carries it. Because he carries it. You carry it. Yeah. Even the schools. We need to reform schools. Oh, God. We need help with the schools. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people graduate college. They don't really get the degree correctly because they just simply buy their research paper off the internet and submit it. To the professors and they graduate college. Yeah, I know what you know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> Amen. So we're producing people that don't have anything up here. Huh. God wants to redeem the institutions of our education. Amen. Yale, Harvard, UCLA, Berkeley. Yeah. Amen. Uh, how many have graduated from those schools that I mentioned? You know, the Lord quickened me. He said, you know, Herman, I want you to think, think differently in different perspectives. You know why I did? I enrolled at Wharton School of Business. And my wife said, you really? You, you want to do that in pastoring and doing this? Yeah, I feel like doing it. It was expensive. <laughs> it was expensive. You know where Wharton is, a pen. And I did. And I completed it. And I said, wow, I didn't know I could do it. But when the anointing of God hits on you, you become smart. I said, I said, me? I feel like I was the smartest. When anointing hits you, there's a creativity. And there's, there's a certain limit that you don't realize. You know, when Spider-Man discovered that he had power, he's like, whoop. I didn't know I could do that, right? Oh, I didn't know I could leap. I didn't know I could climb walls, right? I'm sure Superman did the same thing. They finally realized they have a certain ability that they that we haven't realized then. Now they just simply just manifesting this creativity, anointing. It's like, oops, whoop, I'm discovering it. It's the same thing that God is about to release in you. There's something in you that you thought was dead. There's something in you that you thought, well, it's not there, but it's there. God says it's time to release and release, yeah. bring it forth. Amen. Oh, does it make sense? Wave at me. If, does it make, if it makes sense, wave at me. Wave at me. I'm the same thing with your sons and your daughters, your grandchildren. Prophesy creativity. Yes. Prophesy life. It's like I call forth kingdom ideas, business out of you. Amen. Nothing comes, good comes of it if you just let the video game disciple them. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in this special midweek fellowship. Visit our website for more information to know Jesus. We hope to see you at one of our services this coming Sunday. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you.